Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Alan Rosen, a renowned scholar and educator in Holocaust literature, to talk about poetry and resistance during the Holocaust and after. Dr. Rosen is author of The Wonder of Their Voices, the 1946 Holocaust Interviews of David Boder, and Sounds of Defiance, The Holocaust, Multilingualism, and the Problem of English. He was the collaborator on a French edition of I Did Not Interview the Dead by David Boder, Boder and the editor of Approaches to Teaching Elie Wiesel's Night. Last spring, he visited Holy Cross to talk about his latest project called A New Index for Time, Calendars in the Holocaust. And he was extraordinarily well received here. I can't remember a time when so many people said, you've got to bring back uh, a speaker, as I've heard about Alan Rosen. Alan was research fellow at the Fondation pour la Mémoire de Shoah from, 19, from 2006 to 2009. He also held fellowships at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem, the Katz Center for Advanced Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and the Archives for American History for the History of American Psychology at the University of Akron. Dr. Rosen has talk, taught at universities and colleges in Israel and in the United States, and lectures regularly in Holocaust literature at Yad Vashem's International School of Holocaust Studies and at other Holocaust Studies centers. Educated in Boston under Ili Wiesel, Dr. Wiesel, Dr. Rosen lives in Jerusalem with his wife and four children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Alan Rosen. Many thanks to Professor uh, Landy for his warm and kind words um, and to the general really warm reception here. Uh, it's a privilege to be with you uh, on this um, February night, toward the end of February, um, to speak about what I consider to be an important uh, topic and hope by studying together that you will also have some sense of, of its importance, its possibility, its grandeur, its sadness, together. This is also, uh, in the Jewish calendar, the month of Adar. And uh, Professor Landy so kindly uh, mentioned my project uh, that I continue to work on, a book on calendars in the Holocaust. And when I spoke last year, I uh, explored uh, the, the role of the different calendars, including the Jewish calendar. I won't do that tonight. But just to begin with, the uh, month of Adar, which we're in in the Jewish calendar, then has a precept that sounds unbelievable at first glance that it says, Misha Niknas Adar Marbim Besimcha. When the month of Adar enters, then one should increase one's joy. And so it doesn't sound like such a bad thing at all. Oh, to be more joyous? I think I could handle that a little bit. Most of us can do with a little bit more joy, pleasantness, happiness, and the serenity um, that comes with it. And that's all because of the month of Purim, which comes in the midst of this month, in about, uh, about 10 days um, from now, uh, which is the story rendered by the biblical book of Esther, um, which talks about the attempt to annihilate uh, the Jews of Persia and the uh, great... Uh, a blunting of that uh, terrible aspiration. Um, and so uh, the joy that's there with Adar and this particular event in the biblical book of Esther connects to, our speak, to my speaking tonight and our study together tonight. It strikes me in two different ways. One is that uh, here we have a maxim to be more joyful. Um, 
the Jews do, and we assume vicariously others join into that enterprise. But here we are to talk about the Holocaust, and the Holocaust seems the antithesis of joy. So how can we do proper justice to the two, to our obligations to the calendar as Jews, um, and then a greater community that also participates, on the one hand to be joyful, and on the other to give serious, serious engagement with the Holocaust, which is at the other end of the spectrum. So it's a conundrum that's there for me, and I share it with you, and hopefully we'll try to tease out from our study together a way to try to, if not resolve that conundrum, to at least place them in a, a manageable uh, way of complementing one another. And the second way in which it connects is um, in terms of the, the terrible uh, fantasy and aspiration to al annihilate an entire Jewish community, which we witness as uh, being chronicled in the Book of Esther, and we then come to our own time, time which some in this room may have lived through, certainly parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. And so it's the modern rendition, if you will, of the biblical book of Esther, except that we're in the biblical book of Esther, uh, the project was halted. Here, the project was halted after only a terrible, terrible loss of life. So, we, we see the intersection in two different ways. And the particular angle that I want to explore tonight on poetry and resistance is really a set of reflections, more than a, a sustained kind of analysis, but reflections on a, um, a phenomenon and a reflections on that uh, phenomenon of poetry and the way that poetry, especially during the Holocaust, played the role of resistance. I'll say more about that in a second. And then to even really stretch the reflections to another level. The last particular installment in our study tonight, will endeavor to take what is there during the Holocaust, and the resistance that was manifested to whatever degree I can present this convincingly, um, and take it to the post-war in a particular instance, saying that in one way can poetry and resistance to the Holocaust continue to manifest itself today in our own response to this event, in our own engagement. What would those concepts mean when yoked together? Now, I am not the first to, uh, to do that yoking of poetry and resistance. One can find that under a number of different rubrics, under the rubric of Polish poetry, for example, um, or Vietnamese poetry, both of which have been dealt with in this way of thinking about resistance. And there indeed is an international festival of poetry of resistance that takes place which has a mission statement as follows. We wish to develop poetic language, I quote here, poetic language as a vehicle for artistic expression and creative process which, capture, which captures and presents the life, needs, and dreams of the common people. 
the life, needs, and dreams of the common people. So poetry and uh, the, the poetry of resistance here, changing the preposition a bit, is a way to think of poetry as it comes into the life of not an elite group of those who are writing rarefied poems, but rather a far wider community who are, as this particular way of thinking about it has, who are subjected to various kinds of um, uh, perversions of power by elite groups. There also are those who, when talking about poetry and resistance, say it's a switch from evaluative to more rhetorical, meaning from saying, is this poem good? To asking the question, what does this poem accomplish? And then certain groups and certain languages are uh, are susceptible, one wants to say, to this, this project of seeing poetry as resistance. So Eritrea, for example, has those that are writing and considering what they write to be resistance by saying who we are to ourselves, our enemies, and the rest of the world. And it's a very kind of breathtaking step to think of the poetry that one writes as mattering not only to those who care and are intimate, but to one's enemies. But the um, particular angle tonight of the words too will nourish is that of, as Professor Landy so uh, helpfully said in his introduction, dealing with the Holocaust, particularly during the time of those events. And that has been a concern of critics, commentators, um, in some of the earliest books. But usually it's looked at post-war, post-war writings, like those, for those who may know the field, those by John Hersey or Andre Schwartzbart, the great American and French writers, respectively. Um, and so this locating within the event itself is already something of a change, something of a shift, and one that I believe in fundamentally, meaning all of our instincts are such to say that in that event, which took place, let's recall, between for our purposes tonight, 1939, 1945, in the Gregorian calendar, 5699, and 5705 in the Jewish calendar, that for those five or six years, that the decimation, the privation, the sense of just trying to maintain survival was so great throughout Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe, that to think about literature, to think about poetry as emerging, is, is really seemingly counterintuitive. And yet, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of poems, stories, novels, plays, written during that time. And it's my, my belief and part of my vocation that we don't want to lose those. We don't want to let those slip through our fingers because of our own, our own intuitions. And when we're going to trace now the, the poetry and resistance of this period, we'll want to be exploring in a more nuanced way, perhaps, what exactly that a resistance is. Meaning that we'll see that the poems come to 
to, at times, champion armed resistance. Meaning, despite the great toll of fatality that occurred during the time of the Holocaust, 1939 to 1945, there were acts of armed resistance. The most famous being, of course, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, but there were other uprisings in other ghettos, and there were more local individual acts as well. And so the poems served at times to champion that. They also, I think we're going to see, commemorated acts or the heroes of those acts of resistance. They played that role as well. And we'll then want to see what other role they would play and what exactly then that teaches us about what we're calling resistance. Uh, so as we prepare to take up our, our sheets here, um, and uh, the poems that I read will be partially represented in our packets, and some uh, are not in our packets, but we'll, um, but I'll make reference to them and would be glad to supply them if you would like, that many of these are written in the ghettos that were developed during the Second World War by the, the Nazis, Himak Shemam, and came out of that, but also in other areas. And again, just to recall that when the war began on September 1st, 1939, or in the Jewish calendar, the 17th day of the month of Elul of the year 5699, that the enemy invaded Poland and caused tremendous havoc in addition to the military victory um, and beginning in um, uh, fall of 1939, but taking place more in 1940, the scheme of, uh, of, of inflicting suffering upon the Jews had it that Jews would be congregated in major cities and smaller cities and would be taken from homes to be placed in the poorest areas of the city under very crowded conditions with minimal rations, poor hygiene. So the loss of life in the ghettos alone was great and monumental, even if we're setting aside for the moment the next evolution to the um, death camps. And yet there was, there was a response of all different kinds in literature, arts, culture. So this response was often, though not only, in Eastern Europe, which is where the ghettos were. They were not in Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe and eventually Central Europe, was in the language of the Jews of Eastern Europe, which was Yiddish. Yiddish, a language that was first developed in approximately the 13th century, when Jews were um, then taken from where it developed in Germany expelled to Eastern Europe, the language traveled with. It's a fusion of German, Hebrew, Aramaic, another Semitic language, and Slavic altogether in a potpourri of a sort. And, um, and it's written in Hebrew script. Usually, though, on your pages, the, the Yiddish that's there is transliterated into Latin characters. And this language was and continues to be a language used by Jews from 
of Central, Eastern, some in Western Europe, and taken all over the world. So it continues to be spoken in New York, Buenos Aires, Melbourne, and probably even in Worcester. I mean, you have to open your ears a little bit in Worcester to hear. I mean, it's not probably dense communities, but there are a very, uh, I mean, I know that there are Yiddish speakers in Worcester as well. So the first particular installment that we're going to then um, explore to see what resistance in poetry means in this particular cauldron is the poem by Hirschglick called Silence and a Starry Night. Hirschglick, who has a actually tremendous renown among Jewish and some non-Jewish communities all over the world, and we'll come to that uh, shortly, was born in Vilna in Lithuania um, in 1922. He wrote prolifically from early on. Um, he, uh, and, and especially as during the war, meaning his efforts didn't flag, they rather intensified. Unfortunately, he, though he was able to persevere through the, the ghetto and after the ghetto, the Vilna ghetto was destroyed in 19, fall of 1943, he was deported um, in 1944 to uh, a concentration camp in Estonia and perished there at the age of 22. But he left a legacy. And that legacy is first here in Silence in a Starry Night. Silence in a starry night, frost crackling fine as sand. Remember how I taught you to hold a gun in your hand. In fur jacket and beret, clutching a hand grenade, a girl whose skin is velvet ambushes a cavalcade. Aim, fire, shoot, and hit! She, with her pistol small, halts an auto full arms and all. Morning, emerging from the wood, in her hair, a snow carnation, proud of her small victory for the new free generation. Now, before we go back to this extraordinary poem, something about it, and then I'll read it. the first uh, stanza in Yiddish so you get a little feel of that, and, um, and then we'll look more closely. The um, first official partisan, meaning armed resistance organization that was uh, brought together by the Jewish communities in Europe was already in January 1942 in uh, the Vilna ghetto called the United Partisans Organization, as it translates. And um, the, uh, the first of its actions were undertaken in summer of that year, summer 42, when they went and uh, destroyed a German munitions train one can have some sense of what it was in the middle of the war with Germany having conquered much of Europe, having already in, after being in a treaty with Russia, having broken that treaty in summer of 1941, attacked Russia and was moving toward victory, that too, 
to be able to fight against the colossus that Germany was at that moment was an extraordinary sense of intervention. And it was said that the leader of this particular action was indeed a, um, a young woman whose name is not brought down, but that's how it's said. And Hirschglick then wrote this poem to celebrate that, that intervention that seemed so incredible, so beyond hope. And when we look at this, as, um, as which we'll do in a second, the, the kind of images that are there are so arresting. Let me just read the, the first paragraph of the Yiddish. Still, die Nacht is euch gestand und der Frost er hat gebrennt. Sie gedenkst du, wie ich hab dich gelernt, halt eine Speier in die Hand. So, this first, pair, this first stanza there, silence in a startling night, frost crackling fine as sand, remember how I taught you to hold a gun in your hand. Maybe it's reading this in a university, but I don't think that's only it. The sense in which teaching is at the forefront, meaning what Hirsch Glick is celebrating here is the teaching how to hold a gun because for most Jews who were not in the army, though there were some who had been, but certainly a young woman wouldn't have been, to have that skill was something that could only need to be taught. And that's the background for that is the the, the still, as it says in Yiddish, and the silence that against, the, um, against whose background this teaching is being done. And her then uh, well-armed, she's able to shoot, she stops the train, and then the last stanza is what is just uh, so uh, captivating. Because morning, emerging from the wood where this action took place, in her hair a snow carnation, proud of her small victory for the new free generation. What an act of imagination to conceive of the Jews at this point, even after this revolutionary act of uh, armed resistance, to think of it as a new free generation. They're not free. I mean, for all of our sense of philosophically exploring what freedom is, the freedom that's here is so minimal, so restricted, and yet, the vision that Hirsch Glick brings to this is being able to see that, that possibility of the opening up of a terrain of freedom because the actions are no longer dictated by a dictator. So that's in terms of the language terms of the image, I think what is staggering here is the um, way in which nature continues to um, unfold as it usually does. Meaning there the, the, um, the starry night that is there looking up, the sky is what it is when we look up. And here in this last paragraph, the, the, um, the flower, the carnation that's there in her hair, meaning flowers, stars, 
frost. They're all part of the world as we know it. Unless one thinks that that shouldn't be remarked on, we have to remember that in 1922, I believe, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland caused a watershed in poetry by beginning April, which is usually the beginning of spring, when all of nature comes out robustly and celebrates, he writes, April is the cruelest month breeding lilacs. So that the ways of nature in the world of the wasteland have been inverted. And you might think that during the time of the restrictions of wartime Europe for the Jews there who were restricted far beyond what most had suffered in previous, certainly since the last 100, 150 years, you might think that nature would close down, would stop, but it doesn't at all. It continues to thrive, continues to be stable. And that, to my mind, is a sense of a tribute that Hirsch Glick brings to the, to the kind of nuanced hope in the world that is even stronger than this new generation. The um, companionship to um, armed struggle continued in other places besides Vilna and most famously course in Warsaw. And um, I want to turn to the poem uh, Counterattack by Vladislav Schlengel, um, who was born in 1914, um, a, who uh, contrary to most of the Jewish poets writing to, during this time, did not write in Yiddish, but wrote in Polish. And um, he, uh, he became, developed a, po a poetic persona from quite early on in his life. He then, even during the time when, uh, of the ghetto, he would read his poetry in cafes. And he is said to have perished during the uprising in the spring of 1943. But to appreciate counterattack, um, in addition to reading it, the context is really uh, crucial. Because the Warsaw Ghetto, again, the home of some 350,000 Jews approximately, um, was in up through spring of 1942. Remembering the war began with the invasion of Poland in 1939. The, the um, Jews placed in a ghetto in Warsaw in fall of 1940. In addition to the crowding conditions, they were imprisoned in a ghetto behind an 11 foot high wall. But even when hearing rumors about what had taken place to other communities, it was staggeringly believed that Warsaw, being so large, so imposing a presence, would never be annihilated. This was even the, the feeling that is registered in the diaries of those who are writing during this time in Warsaw, very sober, searching, intelligent consciousnesses. So in the summer of 1942, the Nazis Himakshmam undertook what was called the Great Deportation. And in that period of six weeks, from July 22nd, I believe, into to October 4th, I think it was approximately, 
that some 275,000 Jews were deported to their death in the Treblinka death camp not far from Warsaw. And among those, just to get a sense, and you have to do this, forgive me because you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't, especially young, especially all of us in the month of joy, shouldn't have to be seized by such images and such realities. But to have a sense of the appreciation of Schlengel's poem, one needs this. Not only the, the quantity of those deported, but there were before the deport deportation some 50, 51, 52,000 children in the Warsaw Ghetto, approximately. After the deportation, there were, I think it is, 484. So you can imagine being in a setting where you look around and everyone is gone, virtually. And you are among a small percentage of survivors. And in January, so the, after that, the deportation stopped till January 1943, when they started again. And that was when the first armed resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto took place. In response to the Nazis' humakshimam starting again, the deportations. And it was in honor of this that Schlengel wrote this poem. And as we looked, they plodded calmly to the cars as though disgusted with it all, gazed like dogs at the guards' eyes. Cattle, dapper officers smirked to see that nothing got under their skin, that hordes moved with torpid step and only for sport, lashed their snouts with whips, counting off in the square, some dropped where they stood, even before they could sob in the cars, soaking the sandy ground with tears and blood. And the gentlemen on the corpses let fall, in a casual way, cigarette boxes that said, why, Juno's the kind of cigarette around. So here's Schlengel beginning by bringing this picture, this image of going like cattle, being obedient, following orders, and punctuating that with this silly ad, Mayakovsky-like, for those who know the Russian poet Mayakovsky, bringing in a piece of popular lore that seems to burst in but then, trying to measure again what the meaning of armed resistance could be in such a situation. Until the day when at dawn on the town they lulled to sleep like hyenas. They rushed out of morning fog. Then the cattle woke up and bared its fangs on Mila Street. The first bullet fell. Gendarme wobbled in a doorway looked astonished, stopped a moment, incredible, something isn't right. It had all been so simple, so easy, because of special pull, he'd been transferred away from the Eastern Front a few days R and R to rest a bit in Warsaw, herding the cattle in the action in the axion, cleaning out the sty. And here on Mila Street, blood, he backed away from the doorway and swore, I'm bleeding for real. And meanwhile, Browning's barked on Niska, on Dzijska, on Pavla, on twisting stairs where a mother was dragged down by the hair. Lies the SS man, Hank the strangely tensed, as though he found death, indigestible. 
this revolt like a bone in his throat, choked it in bloody drool, and a box of Junos are round, round, round. So among the extraordinary things here is Schlengel not only trying to find the proper way to talk about that awakening, but also to move into the the consciousness of the perpetrator, that way of thinking of the ghetto as rest and recreation, that sense of what was a prison and death for Jews being for the perpetrator time off without any threat. And for the Jews then to bring a sense of danger, of threat against that was changing the terms entirely. So when we go to the the end of the poem, the last stanzas there. Do you hear, German God, how Jews pray in wildcat houses, crowbars and clubs in their hands? We ask of you, God, a bloody battle. We implore you a violent death. May our eyes before they flicker not see the track stretch out, but give our palms true aim. Lord, to bloody the coats of blue, allow us to see before dumb groaning chokes our throats in these haughty hands, in those paws with whips, our everyday human fear. And then, again, the way in which nature continues to respond. Like purple blossoms of blood from Niska and Mila and uh, Maranova, flames from our gun barrels flower. This is our spring, our counterattack, this wine of battle pounds in our heads. These are partisan woods, alleys of the Ziska and Atrovska. Block numbers flutter on our breasts, our medals in the Jewish war. The shriek of six letters flashes with red. Like a battering ram, it beats revolt. And on the street, a package crushed and sticky with blood. Junos are round. So nature not only follows its patterns, it seems to, in this poem, be elicited by the action of the Jews themselves. So there's no April is the cruelest month. It's that nature, in fact, becomes even more responsive to the Jews here. And the poets are the one to chronicle that, as it were, submission of nature. So they, um, as we um, go on in charting the kinds of modes of poetry and resistance, we've seen poetry as an individual action by this young woman that celebrates her heroism. We see the awakening of a group in the Warsaw Ghetto. But there were other manifestations. So in the Vilna Ghetto, um, later on, there was what was called the Paper Brigade, where the Nazis, their names should be blotted out, forced Jews to take Jewish books, Jewish treasures, and to organize them for the, the Nazis' use. And one of those who participated in this was a great poet, Avram Zutzkever, um, who uh, survived the war and went on to write many great poems. Um, but he was part of this paper brigade that then subverted what was asked of them and smuggled back into the ghetto the treasures. 
And he in a poem I don't think I included in the packet, but it's called Kernels of Wheat, and I'll just read a short part of it, um, written in March 1943. Caves crack asunder, split open under my blow. Before a bullet can get me, I bring you a sack full of gifts, age purposeful pages with purple on silver hair, words on parchment created through thousands of torturous years. Like a hen sheltering its chick, I run with the Jewish word, rummaging in every courtyard so its spirit won't be extinguished. And it's this poem that toward the end um, and um, maybe the words too will wait patiently that will, nature will come here to see the light that predestined hour when they, the words too, burst unexpectedly into flower and like the age old seed that unraveled itself in the stalk so the words, too, will nourish and will belong to the people, the Jewish people, in its eternal journey. So, for Zutzkefer, the resistance is the fundamental preservation of the word. In other words, that becomes the poetic vocation, to care for the word, both in the writing and through the handling of the artifacts. The um, one more from the wartime, and then we'll move to the post-war and conclude, and then have time for um, questions and comments. So the um, most famous of the um, wartime writings is again by the poet, the young poet Hirsch Glick, um, and um, it's on the second page here, and it's Never Say, a poem that Hirsch Glick was said to write in 1943 as a member of one of these organizations, um, and has, like many of these poems, been turned into a song which goes that much wider than the quietness of the poem. And here, um, the words are um, exalted. Never say this is the last road for you, let in skies or masking days of blue. The hour we yearn for is drawing near. Our step will beat the signal. We are here. From southern palms, from lands long white with snow, we come with all our pain and all our woe. Wherever seeped our blood into the earth, our courage and strength will have rebirth. Tomorrow's sun will gild our sad today. The enemy in yesterday will fade away. But should the dawn delay or sunrise wait too long, then let all future generations sing this song. The song was, this song was written with our blood and not with lead. This is no song of free birds flying overhead, but a people amid crumbling walls did stand. They stood and sang this song with rifles held in hand. And it was put to the beat of a Russian marching song. With a sense of marching forthright, nothing stopping. But on closer inspection, the words don't say that. I would submit. Never say, this is the last road for you. Anytime one has a never say, 
it means that someone is saying. Meaning the poem is an argument against the sense of despair. Because in 1943, in Europe, that was the crushing reality, was despair. And we see it in the poem that uh, the, the delay, of course, of the dawn, but then especially in the last stanza, the song was written with our blood and not with lead. This is no song of free birds flying overhead. What happened to the new free generation? It's a year further on, and the freedom that was envisioned is gone. But a people amid crumbling walls did stand. Meaning this is apocalypse. And it's a poem, I would submit, of even with that sense of the bitterest reality of continuing forward. And even here, nature underneath all remains somehow firm, encounters or softens perhaps the apocalypse. So that's a taste of the writing from within the war. And it's, it's both possible to capture the sense of aspiration and the sense, the way in which the poet can see freedom that's really not there, can see the stability of nature that one would think would go completely the other way, would argue against the specter of despair. That's what it seems resistance was. And in Zutzkever's formulation, so that the word will nourish and be preserved. After the Holocaust, then, what does it, resistance and poetry mean? And if you can turn to the, the paragraph, few paragraphs here by Elie Wiesel, ever so briefly, this is a parable that Elie Wiesel, the great uh, survivor of the Holocaust from Hungary, um, uh, born in 1928, a young man during the war, the writer of the memoir Night, and some 45 other books, most of which don't deal with the Holocaust directly, but usually indirectly. And this collection appeared in 1970, called One Generation After, and was published. He told me it was the only time that he's done this, that it was published on April 11th, 1970. April 11th was the liberation, the date of the liberation of the Buchenwald, concentration camp. And he wanted the, the, the uh, collection to appear exactly one generation after, meaning 25 years after. And this is a collection I heartily recommend it. I mean, for those that will consider themselves interested students of the Holocaust, there is much here that is searing and searching at the same time. And this is one. So this parable, one of the just men came to Sodom, determined to save its inhabitants from sin and punishment. Night and day he walked the streets and markets, preaching against greed and theft, falsehood and indifference. In the beginning, people listened, smiled ironically. Then they stopped listening. He no longer even amused them. The killers went on killing the wise kept silent as if there were no just men in their midst. One day, a child, moved by compassion for the unfortunate preacher, approached him with those, these words. Poor stranger, you shout. You expend yourself, body and soul. Don't you see that it's hopeless? And here, the astonishing, surprising answer. Yes, I see, answered the just man. <laughs> then why do you go on? I'll tell you why, said the just man. In the beginning, 
I thought I could change man. Today, I know I cannot, one generation after. If I still shout today, if I still scream, it is to prevent man from ultimately changing me. So here we have the evolu a taste, intimation of the evolution of poetry and resistance to the post-war world where it would seem as we draw further away from this event that the expectations of many survivors and many others that the world would undergo a transformation in a way that such events could never surface. And yet, we see that they do. And yet, there becomes a continued drive of mission to try to make it happen. But at this point, then that yields. And the resistance moves to no longer transforming the world, either with guns or with words. But it then becomes seeing the self-integrity of any given individual to know the difference between truth and falsehood, reality and illusion, to make sure that oneself remains lucid. And it's a it's sharp. In Hebrew we say harif. But I think it charts a certain measure. And now that we're two generations after, that I think we can begin to weigh where the next bastion is of resistance. So we've made a tour, a short tour, of the yoking together of these concepts, seeing wartime and post-war, and the conundrum that's here in Adar of the joy and the true despair, not only of the war, but also of our vision of change, is with us. And I think that certainly one of the ways that that conundrum between the imperative of joy and the temptation toward despair is resolved, or not resolved, is, is drawn into contact is through study. As teacher, as student, as colleagues, as friends. And I just want to say, to finish, this is my third visit to this college. And the, the collegiality that has been built here, the sense not only of a of an isolated sense of study, but the way in which it's become a community of study of these difficult, difficult, challenging events. And it has invited me to become part of that community is one way personally that that conundrum is addressed. Thank you.